Coming up on Dialogue Weekend, China-U.S. relations look set for a bumpy ride with the U.S. Senate laying out a major China competition bill. As ping-pong diplomacy turns 50, does it still have power to improve ties? Every day in this country, 316 people are shot every single day. U.S. President Joe Biden announces measures to tackle the country's gun violence epidemic. Will the new plan have any impact? And this week's Newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qindu. In this year, marking 50th year of ping-pong diplomacy, the U.S. Senate has introduced a bill called Strategic Competition Act of 2021. It says that all strategic, economic, and diplomatic tools of the U.S. will be mobilized to counter China's rising global power. If passed, how will it affect the relationship between Beijing and Washington? And is there any hope of reviving the spirit of ping-pong diplomacy to improve exchanges between the two countries? To discuss the relationship, I'm joined in the studio by Victor Gaojikai, Chair Professor at Suzhou University, and Anna Tangen, Independent Current Affairs Commentator. Well, I would like to have your opinions on you know, your first take of this bill. Uh, so the U.S. will basically use all the tools, diplomatic, economic, military, to counter uh, China's global power. I will start with Victor. Well, first of all, philosophically speaking, I think this bill, even if it is uh, enacted into an act, uh, will not achieve its strategical why because all indications seem to indicate very clearly that the rise of China is inevitable and this is actually a mega trend in the world of today and I think what the US lawmakers try to do is according to my analysis is a Tonya Harding syndrome they want to use all the powers at their disposal or think of new powers at their, to be at their disposal to whack on the Chinese kneecaps, to put China out of competition. But this is, to start with, indecent to uh, do. And secondly, this will not uh, come to fruition according to their wildest expectations because I truly believe China's rise is not, st is not to be stopped by whatever the United States wants to do, either by itself or in collusion with its allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so obviously there's a lot at stake, not only for China and the U.S., all this bilateral relationship, but also the rest of the world. If these two countries can't somehow find a way to deal with each other in a peaceful, stable manner, and then all, all the entire world will be uh, affected with this all-out approach against China. Um, are, you, are you, let's say, in support of such an approach? No, or? <laughs> no of course not. Um, there, there has to be some rationality, and the only forces that are appearing to, you know, kind of um, check this are actually economic. So if you start looking at the political rhetoric, uh, this, this bill has wide bipartisan support. There's no question it will pass, and it will be signed by Joe Biden. But the economic side, is changing. You already had a group of high-tech companies in the U.S. say no. They want to start working with China and they want to iron out these issues. They sent very clear signals. And you're seeing that across the board, even with this stuff with Xinjiang. You're starting to see companies to say, look, if we are locked out of the China market, you know, that's great for the Europeans. It's great for everybody else, but it's not going to be great for Americans and it won't create jobs at home. Already, the U.S. Uh, is, has huge record uh, deficits against China, the highest in 18 years. Donald Trump said he was going to solve that. He hasn't. So economically, things are moving in a quite different direction, and it's hopeful as the world starts looking at an economic recovery that people will start to realize that there has to be some sort of working together. No one has the 5 to $10 trillion that it would take to replicate on both sides. And even if it was replicated, it would uh, Western products would be basically unaffordable anywhere else in the world because of the added uh, labor costs, land costs, building costs, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm wondering if there is a, a, a concern here, you know, previously, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, described the relationship of China's policy on China is, you know, uh, will be competitive uh, when it should be, collaborative when it can be adversarial when it must be. But now the bill is focusing single-handedly on competition, strategic competition with China. 
uh, is there a concern somehow the U.S.-China policy is being narrowed down to competition only? Well, yeah, first of all, I think this bill, or eventually uh, this act, uh, is barking at the wrong tree. Why? Because China is not an enemy of the United States, and the Chinese nation are not enemies of the American people. That's number one. Number two is that to view China or to treat China as an enemy or as a competition to be contained or to be put out of competition is not serving the fundamental interest of the American people. I would urge to the American leaders or decision makers or people at large that the real choice for China and the United States is to live and to let live. That is, US, you can live, but you need to let China live. And China will, will live and will live on, and we will also let the Americans live. Between these two countries, if one country wants to put out the other side uh, out of competition without uh, any consequences or with impunity, this is going to fail miserably. Therefore, well, I think this is time to call on live and let live between China and the United States. Obviously, there is a point, not only on the Chinese side, I guess, you know, thinking this way, but also if you look at, uh, at the American, one of the very important media outlet, Washington Post, there's an opinion piece uh, by uh, Michael Hanlon uh, from the Brookings Institution with the title, the U.S. has very little to gain by over demonizing China. He basically warns that the attacks against China in American foreign policy are trending toward dangerous groupthink. Mostly, he referred to this, uh, you know, genocide uh, description of uh, China's Xinjiang policy. Uh, so, Anna, you know, do you share his opinion here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, first off, the information that's being generated about Xinjiang traces back to a CIA disinformation. And I'm not trying to be paranoid. I mean, uh, this, this Adrian Zenz is paid by a group that was started by the CIA. He emerges onto the scene in 2018 as an expert on Xinjiang matters, which is only peculiar because he's a born-again Christian who don't, doesn't believe that Muslims are going to heaven. In fact, quite the opposite. And he doesn't believe in women's rights. Uh, you know, he's, he's not gay friendly. He thinks children should be beaten. Yet he has emerged single-handedly as as the person who's put out all of the reports about a million people, concentration camps, um, uh, women being deprived of repro reproductive rights. Also, he's the one who said that there's forced labor in Xinjiang. So, how is it possible? that all of this information is known by somebody who doesn't speak any of the languages, has not been to any of the countries, and is on the payroll of the CIA. I mean, it just it, it, it strains credulity. Yet all of the pieces that have been published about this, nothing has been done. But this is the kind of demonization uh, that is happening, and unfortunately, people are buying into it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's put China on defensive. Uh, I mean, this is part of the so-called value uh, you know, the, the Biden administration puts high priority on the value diplomacy, values diplomacy. And uh, somehow, if you look at the Biden administration, you see almost like the continuation of Trump China uh, policy, including the l recent list, you know, enlisting uh, seven Chinese entities into this entity list being sanctioned. Uh, um, and also uh, the confrontation over Xinjiang issue. Uh, but there's a little talk about uh, you know, trade investment, you know, cooperation in economic front, which is very important, as you said here. Uh, Victor, uh, I, do you have this kind of a worry or concern? Somehow we needed to bring the relationship back on track. Yes, we have uh, differences, obviously, over there. It will be there for a long time to come, but we need to do something Yes, indeed. I think uh, to demonize China is uh, evil, and to overly demonize China is devilish. And uh, for a country like the United States to demonize or to overly demonize China will be suicidal. And uh, uh, for China, I think we need to stand very firm on principles, and we do not need to worry too much about this because there are no skeletons in the Chinese closet as far as Xinjiang is concerned. And you talked about value. If we really talk about value, if we talk about genocide, China is opposed to genocide. Look at what the Americans have done to the American Indians. We oppose that. And we will call on mankind to come to a, a proper time to come to reckon this uh, uh, genocide uh, activities committed by the American 
uh, governments for many, many uh, years and a couple of centuries, if not even longer, against the Native American population. They have been almost completely Victor, decimated I, 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 I don't think over the centuries. I, I don't think this argument is a good one. This idea that, oh, what about ism? Oh, I, I, you know, because in essence you're saying, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong, but you're doing something worse, or you did something worse. No. I don't think this that is, is a this good, is not good the argument. Point. No, this is not the point. The point I, I, is I, that if you talk about genocide, let's talk about genocide. And let's, sh let's show the truth in Xinjiang, because there is no genocide. That, that, Why? Because the population of that, Uyghurs yeah, have more than doubled about, yeah, since 1950. But I do agree with you on this side. There's, uh, if Trump was post-truth, all right, you can just say anything, uh, make up your own facts. Biden has become post-hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, here he is, uh, a couple of days ago, they say, um, the U.S. Navy sailed into areas that were claimed by India. All right? Yeah. Now, in, India is not, is, is a member of UNCLOS, which is the national, international standard. The U.S. is not. It chose not to join, yet it is arbitrarily saying that they are the enforcer of the world, the same way they are doing in China. This, you know, is not a rules-based area. This is not a collaboration. This is just the biggest guy on the block is pushing around whoever is they perceive as weaker in an attempt to make sure that they maintain their hegemony. And this is not, it's not just about China. You said earlier, what about the rest of the world? 60% of the GDP is outside the US and China. Those people are watching very closely and they're making judgments about who is in fact uh, the one who's engaging in uh, unpredictable and unlawful behavior. So, uh, and I ultimately, you know, it's about uh, this relationship, like how they will deal with each other. Obviously, there is, um, you know, this is like almost like a cliche, establish the power, the United States, number one uh, global hegemony. And then there's a rapidly rising power, China. I understand the people in the U.S., you know, they have this concern, anxiety somehow. You are, China is rapidly catching up with us. We need to do something probably to slow down or if not beat China. It's really about being wise for the two sides to find a way. We did, this happened prior to World War I. You know, Great Britain was determined to, you know, keep Germany in its quote place. It didn't end well, as we recall, and it, World War I led to World right. War II. You know, historically, we should be learning from the past, not trying to repeat it. It's a, a good point, of course, hopefully, in the people, I mean, or to get to the point there. And also, you know, it's almost like a side effect in terms of China policy for the U.S. domestic situation. Um, the senators, um, you know, uh, concerned senators focusing on the bill who uh, they said this demonstrates the U.S. spirit, partisan spirit. You know, this is a one issue that unites the United States, both parties, at a time of uh, dividedness. Will it unify the U.S. society, help no. the U.S. overcome its own problems? No, I don't think so. I, I think uh, China-U.S. relations over the past several years uh, have been very much poisoned and uh, misrepresented by President Trump and his government and many of his followers. And therefore, I would say the majority of the people in the United States have been fooled by the true nature of China-U.S. relations. Why? Because China is not an enemy of the United States. China has no desire or no determination or no commitment to replace the United States as the top dog in the world. In China, actually, there is a uh, abhorrence to become the top dog of the world, and we see no fun or enjoyment in being the top dog of the world. Why should China consider itself to be the next top dog of the world? We can live with the United States, we can live with India, we can live with all the ASEAN countries, and we can live with anyone or everyone in peace and stability and enjoy our right of uh, economic development. That's the key. Therefore, I think we just need to keep talking to the Americans and keep talking to them that our values and their values are not mutually exclusive of each other. To a very large extent, the Chinese dream that we are talking about and the American dream overlap a great deal. Why? Because the Chinese people want to have better living standard. We want to send our kids to a better school. We want to have longevity, for example. And I think at the very core, these two dreams for the Chinese nation and the American people are not in conflict with each other. We can get along with each other.
I, I, I think probably that's the point. You know, if, if you look at the differences, you see all the two countries are so different, but, they, but there are a lot in common. I remember 50 years ago, the ping pong diplomacy. Those team members, you know, they play with each other, they became friends. Uh, that diplomacy, so-called, played a very important role to bring the two countries together and to forge an official uh, diplomatic ties. Tangen, looking back today, can we bring back that kind of spirit somehow to boost more exchanges among the people, the institutions of there? Uh, probably not in that way. I mean, 50 years ago, the circumstances were quite different. I mean, China was n not even the same stratosphere as the U.S. economically, politically, and militarily. But in terms of spirit, there, you know, the economic side is very, very important. And as China continues to succeed, remember, in comparison, East and West, if you look at where China has been over the last 40 years and the U.S. has been uh, over the last 40 years, China has done very well. It's, it's, done, it's done things with extreme poverty. It's raised people into the middle class at a time when the U.S. is actually losing people in the middle class. So, you know, right at this point, China, I, I don't think it's about telling people, uh, telling the rest of the world what the intentions are. I think it's really about showing, mm -hmm. to continue showing uh, how the socialist pr principles in China are guiding it towards the better living conditions for its people. Mm -hmm. I think that is much more persuasive than just saying, oh, we're, we're nice people. We need a lot of talking over there. Uh, now let's turn to the U.S. President Joe Biden announcing a slate of gun control actions to address the problem of growing gun violence in the U.S. Biden has faced the pressure from Democrats and gun control activists to take immediate action to deal with gun violence in the wake of recent mass shootings. How much have the recent frequent shootings affected American society? And can executive actions really solve the problem of gun violence in the U.S.? Uh, so, Victor, I mean, both of you actually uh, lived both in China and the U.S., have close involvement in both societies. Uh, gun violence with executive actions. I understand you know, the president is under pressure to do something, uh, given what happened over the past weeks. But executive actions, is that in enough to really improve the situation? Well, first of all, I wish President Joe Biden all the luck that he needs uh, in terms of trying to put a better handle on the gun violence in the United States. Secondly, the United States is truly a unique country in the sense that the constitutional amendment enshrines the right of the people to bear arms. And it's not just pistols, for example. Sometimes it's a very, very heavy lethal weapons at the uh, disposal of the people at large. Now, thirdly, I think the American people really need to come to the realization that the times have changed and the times of the 21st century today is very, very different from the 17th century or the 18th century when the Americans, the white settlers, for example, needed guns to kill the American Indians to, and to keep, make sure that the, uh, the Negro slaves uh, were enslaved, for example. Now I think we are more and more in a, a globalized world we should have greater civility with each other. Whatever problems could be solved in a more peaceful way rather than through the ownership or the bearing of the arms. This is something that the American people really need to start to realize. Rather than clinging onto the second constitutional amendment to keep bearing arms and bearing large arms, eventually yeah, but, which but, but will you're, threaten you're, each other. We're both lawyers. Uh, changing the Constitution would take a constitutional amendment and that's very, very difficult. We'll, we'll come back a little bit on that, uh, to that, but um, uh, first deal with this, uh, you know, this uh, like a new concept for people who are outside of the U.S., like ghost guns. <laughs> what kind of stuff is that? Ghost guns are anything that can be traceable. For instance, I can buy parts for guns on the internet and then I can assemble them into a working uh, stock, I mean in a working uh, firearm, and that can be rifles, it can be pistols. There's also another way, this is what's called 3D printing. Mm -hmm. I can actually print, and not only print uh, metal parts, but I can pl print plastic parts that can be used that, for guns that are basically, they won't be seen or identified when they go through security checks. So 
there is a requirement that guns be registered, that they have a serial number. If you try to erase the serial number, it's a crime. So why would a simple thing such as requiring people who try to do this say, if you do this and don't register them, it's a crime? But you know, yet if you turn on uh, certain uh, channels in the United States, like Fox News, you hear commentators acting as if this is a direct attack on the Second Amendment, that the right to make mm -hmm. guns that are untraceable is somehow a hereditary right stemming Reason. back to the uh, constitutional fathers. Well, that's, that's the point. I mean, if you listen to this, uh, the clip we played uh, by President Biden uh, every day, uh, 316 Americans are shot. 106 of them uh, die uh, every day. So that's, remember, that's, uh, that's you know, shocking to a lot of people. And he said, you know, gun violence in this country is an epidemic, epidemic, and it is an international embarrassment. I think, you know, if you compare the US with other countries like the UK, the Australia, even in New Zealand more recently, in 1996, there's a, you know, mass uh, shootings, I believe, in the, the UK, and also similarly in, in, the, in Australia. And then both parliaments uh, very soon uh, approved sweeping changes over their gun control, gun ownership uh, policies or the regulations over there. And then situation changed completely. What about the U.S.? Why the U.S. is so different? Because it's, uh, people think it's enshrined in the Constitution. It was interpreted by the Supreme Court as the right to bear arms. If you read the passage, it was, there's this thing about orderly milita. It was actually intended to allow uh, people to protect themselves, as, as in some respects what uh, Victor was talking about. But that was a time when the government couldn't protect its people on the frontier. They just didn't have the resources. But today, the first duty of a government is to offer a safe place, not only in your home, but on the streets and places where you work and where your children go to school. In essence, the United States has abdicated that. The number of gun sales are going through the roof. Now Asians are buying guns. Why? Because they're being threatened on a daily basis. So this is driving this kind of downward spiral of tragedy and death, uh, which is really, really unfortunate. And it will take a real leader uh, to push that aside and get down to exactly what Australia and Great Britain uh, decided to do. Yeah, speak of these uh, challenges and difficulties to pass any regulation. Uh, you know, there's a proposed uh, legislative uh, uh, ideas by uh, President Biden over there. And the right after that, you see this criticism from NRA, for example, National Rifle Association, and the Republicans. So, Victor, as you said, uh, you know, uh, I mean, if if there's an I don't know how to describe that, like an awakening of the American people. You know, there's a criticism, rising criticism from the Republicans. Obviously, it's very difficult to make any law over there. Well, I, I would say, uh, uh, as far as the Americans are concerned, I hope this should be a humbling experience. Right? Because for the rest of the world, we all believe that the gun violence in the United States is obscene. It's really uh, 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 doing injustice to the American people as a whole. But if they really want to keep this and defend this constitutional amendment to bear arms, for example, rather than figuring out a better way to make sure that the society is more stable and more peaceful, more harmonious, and whatever issues there are can be solved through other more civilized way, for example, then continue to bear arms, continue to kill each other, for example, and continue to shock the rest of the world about the real situation in the United States. But don't believe that bearing arm is part of the real human rights because we don't think that's part of the human rights. We don't think that's part of democracy, for example, to bear arms. Uh, and therefore, the Americans need to come to the conclusion that the concept and the realities of democracy and human rights may differ from one country to another. For example, the Americans have the constitutionally protected the rights of bear arms, whereas for humanity, of the vast majority of the countries outside of the United States, we consider that to be abnormal. That's shocking, for Violence. example. Yes, therefore, to be humbled, I hope the Americans will be in their view about what really constitutes human rights and what really constitutes democracy, rather than try to impose your version of the democracy and human rights onto the rest of mankind, because people simply don't take it. Well, let's uh, leave it there for now and uh, take a look at this week's Newsmaker.
So now, thinking obviously there is a proved link uh, between blood clot with AstraZeneca over there, uh, but still, obviously, uh, you hear the regulators in European Union and the WHO uh, saying that you know the benefits outweigh the risks over there because the side effects is rare. Uh, but the countries, many countries, actually suspending, if not stopping, the use of AstraZeneca on their people. Uh, is that right decision? I know it's not only the professionals who will help make the decision, but also it's the policymakers, it's the government leaders to make the decision. Well, you know, government leaders are elected in, uh, in these countries, and as a result, they do have to listen to perception. If, you know, somebody dies, or a child, an elderly person, and people rally around that, that can be very dangerous for the government. Uh, the fact is that the, um, the chances of getting a blood clot are somewhere between 1 to 100, every, every 1 in 100,000 or 1 in 250,000, depending on who you're listening to. Mm -hmm. And chances of dying are 1 in a million. Uh, based on the number of, of uh, shots that have been administered. The reason this is still out there is that this drug is, is, doesn't require the super freezing that uh, is required by other ones. It um, can be distributed, it's three to four times cheaper than the other things that are being uh, offered uh, on the Western side. Mm -hmm. So there's a real desire to use this. And COVEX, which is the United Nations uh, you know, uh, fund to try to uh, provide this to uh, the world, is heavily reliant on this. But there have been real problems and, and missteps uh, by the company, which is a Swedish um, English uh, com company uh, that did its research in Oxford. Now, the approach they took is called mRNA, mm -hmm. messenger RNA. And what it does is it's able to transform these viruses and protect uh, against, against it, create a, a antibodies that uh, are effective. But it ha didn't have the normal amount of time to kind of work through what it was. And, you know, there was a few weeks ago, uh, the U.S. complained that the information was not up to date. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this may be administrative uh, in, in the sense that they've been trying to produce these. Uh, they wanted to put out 90 million. They're only going to be able to put out 30 million. Uh, so, and there's some controversy within the EU about letting other countries have it before they get it. No. Uh, so how will it uh, affect this global vaccination distribution and, of course, the programs? Victor? Well, uh, my view is that for uh, AstraZeneca, uh, for them to uh, push through this particular vaccine in a very short period of time against uh, huge difficulties itself, that in itself should be uh, uh, appreciated. Secondly, now on the market there are quite a few different vaccines and the health organizations and different governments should be able to pick and choose to the extent of availability is, is procured, for example. Uh, therefore, I think more work need to be done and AstraZeneca itself should also do some more homework to make sure that that vaccine should be a better and more foolproof because the purpose of taking vaccine is to prevent getting infections or dying from the uh, uh, yeah. pandemic. To improve but, the safety. I exactly, but if I take the vaccine and get blood clot, for, ex for example, that in itself becomes the problem. So I Beat think the, uh, the uh, uh, countries can have better choices going mm. forward. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingzhou. Thank you for watching. See you next week.